Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 101. My guest today is Bryant Cruz, who has been a pioneer in the application of AI technology to difficult real-world problems. After serving for eight years as a naval aviator, he returned to school for an MS in Space Systems Engineering from Johns Hopkins. While on the mission operations team for the Hubble Telescope, he found a personal mission to change the way spacecraft were operated by seeking a way to capture human knowledge in computers. This work led him to a six-month residency in AI at the Lockheed AI Center in Palo Alto. He went on to found two successful AI companies and now New Sapiens, which offers tools like companion AIs. We'll learn more about that in the interview. Just to give you an explanation of a couple of things referred to in the interview, Minsky's Society of Mind, that was a theory of Marvin Minsky, one of the founding fathers of AI, if you will, and also the title of a book of his where he said that our minds are built up of putting together simpler parts, starting with agents, which are themselves built up of even simpler parts, which, here's the key point, do not themselves have the quality of intelligence or consciousness. So a theory of emergence, if you like, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And then we make a reference to Stochastic Parrots, a paper by Timnit Gebru and others for which she was fired by Google in a notorious incident. And that phrase is her description of transformers like GPT-3, which are sophisticated language models. But the term stochastic means relating to probability. And so this was saying that those language models are driven by random numbers applied to the language inputs they had, which are gathered from the internet and hence already biased racially and in other ways. Let's get to the interview. Bryant Cruz, welcome to AINU. Glad to be here, Peter. Thank you. And you started out your career flying planes for the Navy. I can't resist saying Top Gun, Tom Cruise, but it wasn't quite <laughs> that, and plus different spelling of Cruise. <laughs> Tell us something about that so we have an idea of where you came from. Well, it was kind of unusual to find myself in the Navy because I went to a school of Russell Wall from the Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, but it was St. John's College where I studied the great books. It was a liberal arts curriculum. But after four years of discussing philosophy and things like that, I was kind of hungry to actually do something rather than talk about it anymore. So I found myself as a Naval Aviation Officer candidate, ended up being stationed back in Patuxent River, Maryland with a strategic communication, flying the four-inch and C-130 Hercules, which was about as far as you might imagine from discussing the great books. But it was a great experience. And one thing about the way the Navy operated its missions is we were a 16-person crew on a big airplane, and we were told basically to go out for two weeks and operate more or less independently to do our mission. So it was a great education in practical reality. It was no longer theoretical. You had to do things right, and you had to be situationally aware of all the factors, the environmental factors. And so it really had a profound effect on me going forward about the mental and cognitive skills you need to solve real world problems by being focused on what's in front of you. I always call it the skill of an engineer. An engineer looks as opposed to the scientist who thinks about what might be there, what should be there, what are the underlying causes and formulates theories. An engineer has to be very focused on what's there. And I was just talking yesterday with a friend of mine about the difference between being a scientist and an engineer. And that you know, we can talk about theories all the time and they are maybe the best knowledge we create, I believe, about the universe. But in the engineering realm, a bridge either stands up or it falls down. In the end, there's a hard test in reality. So I thought that part of my education to add to the theoretical background was very important to me. And after that, you moved to the Goddard Space Flight Center and Lockheed for the Hubble Space Telescope. What did that bring to your education in this respect? 
Well, you know, everything kind of connects together. There's so many threads, uh, the warp and weave of a person's life. I really enjoyed aviation, but I felt a very strong connection to space and to being part of that great adventure. So when I left the Navy, I went and entered a program in space systems engineering at Johns Hopkins, a master's degree. But I no only got matriculated, then I got my first job in the industry and found myself very quickly down on Hubble and working on it. And my job there was... I was in charge of the operating and operational analysis and the training of the control center operators for the onboard data management system. And when I walked into the control center and saw how they were operating spacecraft, which was basically people, individual highly trained technician, basically, on the onboard data management system, sitting at a console with a big screen and watching numbers on screens, which were tables of numbers, which were telemetry. I know, Peter, you probably are very familiar with that from control centers and things that go on at JPL. But from my perspective as a Hercules pilot, I was kind of horrified because I said, well, this is a science project. How could you fly the vehicle? And we're talking about a vehicle. It hadn't been launched yet, by the way. We were three years from launch at that time. Bigger than a Greyhound bus up in high Earth orbit. By looking at numbers on screens, which are telemetry values, with mnemonics like CBAT, 6 VLTS, you had to know that that meant battery 6 voltage, okay? Mm. And then you see a number, 28.2, 28.1, 28.24. And based on all these numbers at the same time, you're supposed to know what's going on with the vehicle. Mm. And you're supposed to know that if you send a bunch of commands, which are also encoded in hexadecimal, Mm. that the vehicle is responding normally. So was your reaction based on this is a cognitive overload situation, like you're coming at this from being a pilot where reaction time is everything. And so the avionics systems are engineered to make that information go into your brain as smoothly as possible. Exactly. And here's someone looking at a console where they've got to translate what that acronym means, and then they've got to translate the digits into an analog representation in their head of is this good or bad. And that's an overhead. But they're also, they're not flying something where they could be shot down or they have to react in milliseconds. How much does it matter? It matters hugely because the Hubble Space Telescope was a national asset. Still is. It was irreplaceable. I forgot how many billions of dollars have gone into it from the beginning. It was irreplaceable. No, no lives would be lost. But spacecraft have been lost from sending the wrong commands, from misinterpreting telemetry. It's the wrong way to do it. Mm. And it became a mission of mine to change the way satellites were operated. And I came in there and you know I was trained as a space systems engineer. I knew what those numbers meant, but human beings aren't good at keeping up and doing that translation in real time. When you have to keep up, you have a real time stream. There were 4,000 telemetry parameters. Space station has hundreds of thousands, I think, but 4,000 on the Hubble at that time. That's engineering only, mm. not science. And so we had six or seven people trying to keep up with those numbers. And I can recite you cases where spacecraft were lost because they couldn't interpret the data. We might get into that, but let's go over what does it mean to keep up with those numbers when they're looking at those displays? What are the humans doing with them? Well, you want to know what the state, say, of the battery is, if that's part of the data, or the state of the onboard tape recorder. They had tape recorders at the time. And so you know that if this parameter is in the state one, and this one is between that number and that number, and this fourth one has a certain value, and a fifth one has a certain value, then the state of the recorder is playback, okay? That's a lot of cognitive processing, and it takes time to do that. So what you want is like you go up to your stereo system, and it sits in playback. It's got a big, you know, Mm. you know, in that sense, it's a graphical thing. But, But I saw the problem is, I know what the telemetry means. Give me enough time, and I can get there. But what we wanted, what I saw was a problem. I wanted the computer. That's what they're good at is data processing. So I saw the problem as one of putting the knowledge that I already had in my mind, my expert knowledge, into the computer and let it use its speed and repeatability and deterministic processing loop to unequivocally and effectively and accurately translate those numbers into vehicle states, which could be prevented to me, just Mm -hmm. like the cockpit of a C-130, actionable information that I can really understand and take action on. So that became my mission. So I think the question for me here, and maybe the audience, is what levels the human in this operation center are occupying in a command and control hierarchy 
or loop. The data instruments are reflecting this stream of telemetry back to them that's just labeled at the level of this instrument with this code has this value right now. That isn't what they're there for. At some point, they've got to accomplish mission parameters like point at this star and open the shutter to take this image without pointing at the sun in the meantime or running out of propellant or all kinds of other things, which are pretty algorithmic but hadn't been instantiated anywhere except the human's brains. And Well... They're not really algorithmic, they're procedural. Mm -hmm. And in order to do a science experiment for the Hubble, it, the process actually starts months in advance. When you pick out the target, you pick out the instrument, you pick out the instrument settings, and then you start working on the FMBGs. Where does it have to point? Mm -hmm. And so all this gets worked out in a set of procedures, eventually gets converted to a command load, okay, which then you load it to the vehicle. And then on the point of time, you kick off that load and the onboard commands execute the procedure that the humans had to meticulously create. And a lot of that is because of the way the system's designed. Mm. You can't fly it like an airplane. It's not designed like an airplane. It's designed like a science experiment. And of course, you, you would still have to do a lot of planning. Just like mm. to fly an airplane, you have to do mission planning and you have to sit down ahead of time and figure out where you're going to go and how much fuel you're going to need and apply your expert knowledge. But the control mechanism for spacecraft and the interfaces and all the things are extremely expertise intensive, extremely data intensive, and extremely dependent on humans in the loop, hmm. giving themselves ahead of time. For instance, in a C-130, if you got a fire, you got a handle, lights up red, you know, you got a fire in four, pull the handle. They can't do that because of their control system for spacecraft. So they put it in safe mode and says, so just stay safe. Mm -hmm. We'll figure out, we'll analyze all the telemetry and then we'll figure out. So that's how I got into artificial right. intelligence. Yes. I said, I want the computers to do this for me. How can I get knowledge that my knowledge into the computers so they can process the kind of knowledge I have, but they can do it with their speed and reliability and ability to crunch the data. Because you saw a room full of people acting like machines, yes. carrying out machine-like operations, and you well wanted put. the machines to do that. Right. And that's one side of an equation with AI. Of course, another one is, are we getting machines to act like people? But that's further down the road. We don't have to get into that. I'd love to. I'm ready well, we to could, We can do that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, that'll be the second thing we talk about. I'm also thinking that what you describe is analogous to a nuclear reactor control room. Yes. Where the human goal is produce power without melting down. Mm -hmm. And you've got a thousand dials to maintain to do that. And we know that that created cognitive overload in some well-documented situations. And their actual control interfaces are in some ways more straightforward and better than what we have in satellite control rooms. Although, mm. at least over the years, they've gotten somewhat better at you know, presenting graphical schematics and things like that, where the telemetry is not just in tables, but they've become more advanced. But yes, the problem of cognitive overload based on human beings are data processors and we can do calculations, but we don't do it as reliably and fast as computers can do it. So whenever you have that situation, you want to push the equation toward the machine and let them do what they do well and let the humans do what they do well. When we put it like that, when you say it like that, it sounds obvious. It sounds like, <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't we? And so why didn't we? Why did it take so long? Well, they tried. I tried. My first company with Telerian was designed specifically to solve this problem by using expert system technology at the time expert system technology, now called symbolic AI, mm -hmm. is based on the premise that you can solve these kinds of problems by manipulating symbols using a computer's ability to do logic in a very deterministic fashion, and that you could do it by giving it an X number of rules. Mm. And the problem I had at that time is the expert systems engines that they had, the computers weren't very fast, were they, at that time? Mm. So they took up a whole computer just to run the inference engine. Mm -hmm. So what I did at my first company, we... NASA sent me out to Lockheed AI Center to study AI to help solve this problem. And I took up with some uh, engineers out there. And we found a project to do the first what we called the real-time expert system. In other words, an expert system engine, a rule-based engine that had enough performance to keep up with the telemetry stream. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, we had to put the user interface on one computer and the input engine on another computer and data interface on another computer. 
And then we had to write the software to get the computers to mm. talk because it, the Ethernet hadn't really been invented yet. And we did it, but we ran into the same problem that everybody ran into with mm -hmm. symbolic AI. And that the notion was we were relying on an algorithm logic to do that. And I remember being told when I went through my residency in AI out of the Lockheed AI Center, and we had the AI professors come up from Stanford. They said, yeah, this is how you think. You actually have rules and you're applying these, you're just not aware of them. And I was kind of skeptical at the time that I thought of everything in terms of if then rules. But nonetheless, that was what the wisdom was mm. in that case. But it didn't scale, did it? I could analyze my first experiment. I successfully analyzed 100 telemetry points and program took about 15 minutes to run. And it was better than a human could do but mm. in terms of its reliability, but it wasn't quite real time. And then when we tried to scale it, it just didn't scale. And so I actually, we abandoned that. And at my next company, we came up with a, a way that actually mm. arguably was the first time we succeeded in putting knowledge into a computer. Well, I want to get into this relationship between the symbolic AI and the connectionist AI and where we go from there. And just to fill in the gaps, perhaps for the audience on what you were talking about, you were using Prolog or something like it, it perhaps for that symbolic rule processing. And I remember we were trying mm -hmm. that at JPL and navigation section, just experimenting with that. And although I wasn't central to that, my impression of that was that you could easily demonstrate simple examples, like you could put in the rules to play the animal game, guess the animal, and that the system was one way, instead of having to write out a whole set of if-then-else blocks and get them in the right order, you would write them out in any particular order you wanted, and the system would figure out how to connect them together to get a result. But either you were solving something so simple you didn't need it in the first place, exactly. or the number of rules that you did need was too great for you to figure out what they all were. Exactly. They all started out well, but then the performance versus effort flattened out and became asymptotic. Right. And so you could never get to yeah. the level of performance you need. And that was universally proven. And this is the point in AI history where AI took a downturn, where people said, well, this is never going to amount to anything. And it was rescued by the deep learning and the neural networks and the hardware coming up to the point where we could execute those. And now we have systems where we have no idea how they work. But if you train them, they can surpass human performance on pattern recognition type of tasks. Pattern recognition, yes. But they're statistical beasts, aren't they? Mm -hmm. If you have a problem whose solution lies in statistics, it's very powerful. Right. But not if it's the other way. Like to a, a machine learning expert, if you have an engine and you ask it, what's 2 plus 2? And it says 3.97. They say, great, we're done. That's well <laughs> within the bounds. That's not the class of problem that should be solved that way. Facial recognition, sure, it would be a great result. So now... At some point, you started getting into this field of AI deeply enough to see the limitations of the good old-fashioned AI, the symbolic AI, and the network-based AI. So what was that train of thought like for you? Well, I actually went a step beyond symbolic AI. And I mentioned I had a second company who still focused on telemetry analysis. We took a different approach and that we said, well, what is knowledge? If you look at the functionality we're trying to achieve in computers, we talk about intelligence. But, you know, if, if Albert Einstein's brain if it was in a Cro-Magnon, theoretically he had the same intelligence, the same IQ, but without knowledge, he wouldn't have figured out relativity, right? So you have two aspects there. You have intelligence and you have knowledge, okay? And we talk about what intelligence is and we know intuitively what it is in the sense we don't know how it works, but it's that characteristic, that quality that human beings have in such a degree compared to other animals that it amounts to a difference in kind. But specifically, we recognize it by its results because what humans really makes us unique is our ability to alter our environment, right? To an extent that no other species can do that we know of. So what is that? Well, it's knowledge. It's the knowledge of the world. So it's really... The approach that I took after my experience with the failure of symbolic AI was, oh, maybe we don't need a science of intelligence so much, artificial intelligence. We need a science of artificial knowledge. So 
the failures of the past and the failures of past epistemologies were basically, well, knowledge is a bunch of facts, right? And even in classical epistemology, they would talk about the whole thing as to prove the truth or, or falsehood of assertions. But what if that isn't what knowledge is? Mm. So this is all happening. The first step I took toward this was back in the 90s. We didn't call it AI because you couldn't, <laughs> because you were in the middle of the AI winter. And if anybody said AI, they laughed you out of the room. Mm -hmm. We just called it advanced automation technique for spacecraft analysis. But going back to my undergraduate notions of epistemology, I realized the best knowledge that we have about the world, about the universe, or I should say about nature, to be more specific, is to the scientific method. And those theories are models, right? They're not a bunch of facts. They are carefully constructed models. For instance, the Ptolemaic model with the Earth at the center and all the planets and the stars going around there. Now, it was perfectly scientific. They had certain different premises they started with, but they looked at the phenomena, they looked at what they saw, they formulated a theory about what was going underneath of it, and then they see if they could make some predictions based on that, which is straight scientific method, even though it was before Francis Bacon came along and articulated it better. And it worked for certain things very well. You know, it worked for predicting when the eclipse was going to come. It predicted when the spring tides were going to be here. You predicted when you should plant your crops. And it told you how to navigate a ship around the surface of the globe, which was understood to be spherical. And in fact, it did that very elegantly with a very simple instrument called a sextant. Now, later, Newton came along with another model. And we said, oh, see, those Greeks didn't know what they were talking about. It's the sun that's in the center. And of course, it was different premises. And it's really about sports at a distance and, and mechanics and all this stuff. And it was a better model because it explained more stuff. Mm -hmm. The same model now explains when the moon rises and when it sets and why an apple falls from a tree. That's cool. But you know, and this is a great insight for me. So when we're out there flying C-130s over the ocean, one of the modern navigation tools we had is something called an inertial navigation system. And it was an entirely Newtonian animal. It was this big thing that strapped in the rack and it had inertially stabilized platforms and accelerometers and gyroscopes. And you start with you on the ground, you punch in your lat long and you take off and it tells you where your lat long is all by solving the integration of the third differential. And it was really cool, except it was really complicated and it would break a lot and it would fall down and it would drive us with tumble. And so you know what we did? We had a little hole on the top of the airplane that you could open up and shove up this little thing, which is essentially a telescope. No, it wasn't a telescope. It was a sextant. Mm. And we cranked in the star shot. We looked at the tables and we figured out where we were. Those tables basically were the same ones that Ptolemy put together in Alexandria. So what did I learn about scientific theories and knowledge? It's not really about absolute. It's about utility. And utility is where I want to go with this because you weren't just sitting behind a desk in some tenured university department thinking about this, you have gone into business to make this work. That requires a whole higher level of empiricism and making it work on the ground. What has that experience of putting your ideas to the test been like? Well, it's been very rewarding, really. I mean, in my case, I kind of, from the beginning, saw myself as a scientist or a natural philosopher, but I was very interested in the theory and in epistemology, if you will. But I had this very, very practical, through the Navy and being a space systems engineer, trying to solve real problems. And as I said, these are engineering problems, and it either works or it doesn't work. When, for all the theory, whether I was big on the theory of the thought that uh, symbolic AI was theoretically sound or not, when it didn't work, it didn't work. So I had to look for something that worked. And I did go back to theory, or later the theory informed what I did. But what I call what I'm doing or what we're doing at New Sapiens right now in AI, which is working, <laughs> I call it sort of like, I said, it's like Roman engineering. Well, what's Roman engineering? Okay, well, some point, somebody in early Rome in Italy, someplace, was trying to get across the stream and they, and they piled up rocks in a certain way and they made an arch. And they didn't know how, why it stood, but they saw that it did stand. And once you can build an arch, you can build an aqueduct. And if you can build an aqueduct, you can build a pantheon by spinning that arch in three dimensions. And the pantheon is still standing. 
And recently, our modern day scientists went in there with all kinds of strain gauges and instrumentation with all their knowledge of resolution of forces and statics and dynamics. And they measured and they found out why the Pantheon had those interesting little ridges around the edges. It turned out if you took them off, it would fall down. Because <laughs> you know? now that we have a theory to understand that now, but that's kind of what we're doing. We went in and we did start with a theory, what mm -hmm. we're doing at New Sapiens, because we're looking at knowledge. So we started with this conjecture. Okay, so we look into our minds and we look at our ideas. We don't know how the brain does it. We have no idea, really. Yeah, it's a neural network, but layer upon layer upon layer of complexity and this and that and the other. Six million years of cognitive evolution and biological evolution. So, wow, that's really something. But, well, can't build an artificial brain. Mm -hmm. But we can introspect the knowledge as it's useful to us in our own minds. And we see that we have ideas that correspond, we think, to the world. At least our knowledge allows us to predict the phenomenon. Mm. So we have enough knowledge about the world. We have ideas about what will happen if I jumped off the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. And we can test that. And so we know not to. <laughs> and so the knowledge has utility. Our models, our ideas have utility in helping us change the world, which is what we're trying to do, right? Mm. And these ideas in our brain, and I think this is the essential problem of general AI, are encoded or represented in our brains in some structure that we have no idea what it is. But the only way that they come out of that brain is in this linear form of words through our mouth, which is A, linear, and B, ridiculously compressed. And to then try and deconstruct from that the or construct from that the original representation when we don't know what that original representation was has been the reason we've been chasing our tails for decades. Well, yes, but what we did, we backed off one from that. Let's not get to the language problem. Let's not get to the communications problem. Because if you look at it, you can communicate knowledge without language. You know, the first crow magnet chipping a stone arrowhead can come over here, you know, and chipping, you know, they could, they could show. They had show, but no tell, right? <laughs> Let's not show and tell, they had show. So the, clearly you can have knowledge, okay? And this is one of the insights that is fundamental to what we're doing at New Sapiens. Back at St. John's, reading the philosophers, always this, this big discussion about whether you could have knowledge and intelligence without language or whether it was dependent on language. And we've distinctly come down on the I belief or in the practice that no, they're separate. Language is a communications protocol. You have to already have knowledge in one mind and a commensurate store of knowledge in the other mind in order to be able to communicate ideas because the words have to relate to ideas that already exist in each other's minds. So knowledge clearly precedes language. Mm -hmm. Once you have a minimum core of ideas, only then is language possible. And you see that as a child is learning of the world around them initially through sight, through, through direct sensory input, and only gradually do they start associating words with their sensory experience. So the knowledge precedes that. So what we did at Nate Sapiens is we looked into our minds and we tried to see, take the language out of it, but what do you see? Well, we could see that our ideas, the more complex ideas were composed of simpler ideas. And that it wasn't just a bunch of random facts floating around, that our knowledge was models of the world and models are carefully constructed, in this case, out of ideas that are, related to other ideas in specific ways. So this looks like the way, you know, imagine the way material atoms and connect together to form simpler atoms to form more complex molecules, to form more complex materials. So we took this, said, well, let's, since that looks the same, let's imagine we take our ideas and we start breaking them down into simpler ideas. And let's make the conjecture of Democritus and say, let's keep breaking them down to the point you can't break them down anymore. It's like Minsky's so, society of mind. Maybe. But in the end, what we ended up with, is there then atoms of thought? Hmm. That is fundamental ideas that are the building blocks of all knowledge and all other ideas below which you can't go. And if there is, are, do they have properties that control their connections? Okay, so that they are constrained to connect together to create more complex ideas that are fundamentally such that what they create is knowledge of the world and not of nonsense. And it turns out, yes, both of those things are true. And that's what we have done at New Sapiens. We have identified atoms of thought and we've identified the rules of combination and we've classified them such that in a way that would correspond to, say, 
analogous to the periodic table of the elements, except it's not periodic. But the point is that given an, uh, a cognitive atom of this type and a cognitive atom of that type, how may they combine or not combine? And then as you build up more complex ideas, the molecules and up into the minerals, how do those things connect or not connect? Mm. And by doing that, and we have to do this manually, okay, let's take these atoms and connect them together in such a way as we build a model of the common sense world. Now, there you use a loaded term, common sense. Everyone likes to use that word. We all feel like we know what it means, but it doesn't seem possible to break it down. I guess if it weren't common, the thing that makes it common sense is what makes it impossible to define it rigorously. No, not at all. I would have to disagree with that. I think we make a big deal about common sense right now because it's something machine learning can't do even a little bit. So it's all mysterious because if we think machine learning is on the road to artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. then it's got to be able to do common sense and it can't. And machine learning, as we understand it, I believe never will. But common sense for the most part is just common knowledge. That is things about the everyday world that we all know is true. Okay. And if you model the things in the common sense world and model their characteristics and what they can do and what they can't do. And you start that as a baseline in a computer. That is common sense. It's really common knowledge. Well, I think we use the term as a shibboleth or a catchphrase to distinguish what humans know from what machines know. Two plus two equals four is not common sense. It's axiomatic mathematics. It's a calculation. Mm -hmm. But if you follow our line of work and our line of reasoning, knowledge is a model. It's not composed of symbols, it's a structure. It's a structure that recapitulates or resembles something in the world such that what you, by looking at the model, you can predict the behavior of the thing of which it is a model. Mm. It's not a symbol. So a picture is kind of a very simple model. I can look at a picture of something and I, it'll tell me a lot about the real thing, mm. okay? It's not a symbol. One of the things that we use in our, and when we're trying to explain this, I put the formula for glucose up there. It's, you know, C6, H, whatever. And it's a bunch of symbols, but you have to know the syntax. You have to know the encoding conventions and eventually it will tell you something about it. And then I put a picture of a model of a glucose molecule up there and you can see 10 times more stuff about it and you see it that fast. That's why we say a picture is worth a thousand words because you don't have to, all the encoding, symbolic encoding. So that's why the symbolicists failed they got wrapped around in the symbols. They were stuck in a communications protocol instead of modeling things directly. So we model them directly. So what does a machine know? By our standpoint, machines don't know anything because they don't have any models. Okay, they can calculate. They can manipulate data. They can manipulate information. They can take one type of information and they can turn it into another type of information, all basically by mathematical calculation. But no one has given them the structure until now. That's what we've done. Now they have something to think about. Now they know something. And looking at the site for New Sapiens, this shows up in the form of, for instance, a companion that you describe as being an agent on a smartphone that you can communicate with that does a lot of things that uh, I would like to have. Uh, an assistant can't afford a personal assistant to do all mm. this stuff for me, but maybe this would do that kind of thing and it would be affordable. And it irresistibly sounded like Samantha in the movie Her. I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> oh, uh, Scarlett Johansson off screen voicing an AI assistant on a smartphone. Very thoughtfully mm -hmm. done. Yes. So I can't ask you if that's what it's like, but maybe you can describe it. I know enough about those things. That, you know, the difference is, and I think in the movie, the men formed a romantic attachment. And uh, of course, uh, people do form romantic attachments to chatbots, even though they know it's an illusion. They know it doesn't have comprehension. It doesn't have emotions. It doesn't understand a word they say. It doesn't understand a word it says. They know this, but such is the power of human theory of mind that we Throw it away anyway, because it feels good. In the case of a sapien, it's what we call these things that we've created since we needed a new common noun for them because each instance of the software, as it learns and extends its knowledge it's born with, and it, of course, in our case, it's born already kind of with a common sense world model on the order of a five-year-old, four-year-old, or at least it will when we get it ready to go to market. We're getting close to that. It's comprehending language in the same sense we comprehend language. 
which is completely alien and different to what, say, GPT-3 does or machine learnings do when they process language. And thankfully, there's still a little rigor with language left in the field that they say GP3 generates text as opposed to talking. But yeah, they sometimes say talking, but it generates text. It's not communicating because it has nothing to say, right? Right. Uh, the uh, term was a stochastic parrot from Timnit Gebru, which is pretty good. Yes, that's exactly what those things are. They're parrots. I use that same term all the time. But what a sapiens does, it has a model of ideas that are interrelated, that are implemented in software, in sort of a structure, a graph-like structure. We can think of it as a graph structure. It's not composed of symbols. It's a series of relationships and nodes, if you will, and, and relationships. But when you give it words, it words will have a reference to some place in that model as an entry point. So as you communicate, it goes to the same communications protocol that humans do. Now think what that is. So you have an idea, you want to explain what a parrot is. And to someone who doesn't know what a parrot is, and you say, well, it, it's a colorful green bird with a big yellow beak, and they can mimic human speech. So in order to tell them that, you had to take your idea and everything you were a parrot, and you had to break it down into kind of simple component ideas. You know, it's a bird, whatever bird is, feathers. So you describe it. So you encode all that in just a few words. And you arrange them in grammar, which is say, look up these references in your mind to these, you know, and then put the ones, if you've got references to them, then bring those references in and decode the grammar, which is kind of telling you how to put them together to create this idea of a parrot based on ideas that you already had. It's now put together. So you already have to have knowledge in the machine on both sides of the communications question to have communication. So GPT-3 isn't communicating it's not using language in the same sense, but a sapiens is doing exactly that same process. So what is the tall tent pole, the challenge in constructing this? In GPT-3, the cost is in training it. have got to feed it terabytes of data. It costs millions of dollars to train it in electricity. And so in your system, what is it? The effort, where does that go? Well, well the original effort of the past 15 years was the philosophical breakthroughs in the science, creating a science of knowledge, as it were, and figuring out what the atoms of thought were and what the connection properties were. And that was the hard part. Now it's much less, it's building the model itself is fairly intricate. So that has to be done by hand to give it that initial core. It's like we're inventing DNA and we're putting DNA together because it's this core, this what we call the cognitive core, which is knowledge about knowledge at the root of all this, has to be hand built. And then on top of that, you build a model of a common sense world as your starting point. And the utility of this model, this knowledge that we're putting in, because all models have a utility that they're designed to support. So what we call the common sense world model is to support the comprehension of everyday language. And so once you can support comprehension of everyday language, you automatically have a very powerful tool that you can tell it things and it will remember them for you. And then you can build on that to give it more and more knowledge and give it expert knowledge and more and more intelligence in terms of not one giant master algorithms, but lots of little algorithms, which can be again discerned by how we see ourselves solving problems. So that's what it took. So how big does that common sense model have to be? Much smaller than you might think, because there's a rough correspondence with the everyday concepts or everyday ideas that we need help with, right? As we go through our lives like that you do in a personal assistant to give you. So there's a rough correspondence. It's probably closer than an order of magnitude, but it is rather rough. Between everyday vocabulary words, because they point to ideas in the model or entry points in the model that are in common use. But it turns out, and you probably heard this statistic, that about 70% of all the words on the internet are the same 1,000 words. You get to 2,000 words, you get to 80% of all the words of the internet. They're all the same 2,000 words. Then, of course, it goes up eventually asymptotically. The English has about a million words, but we don't need them for everyday common sense interactions and transactions. So our world model today, the common sense world model, underneath of it, that cognitive core, there's maybe 100 of these, quote, atoms of thought arranged in a careful architecture. And then we've got about 3,000 ideas uh, built together in this model, and they're all connected. But what we're doing now, which is the tedious part, right. is we're building out those rooms. Imagine it's a skyscraper with 3,000 rooms. We've got the skeleton up, we've got the curtain walls up, and now we're putting the plumbing, and heating, electricity, and furnishing to each room, each idea. And if you interact with the sapiens today, 
all of a sudden you'll be talking to it and it goes, wow, it really understood what I was saying. And then you'll talk about something else and it'll be surprisingly ignorant mm. because we haven't built out those set of rooms yet. But as we complete that, it goes faster and faster. And here's the cool thing about it, Peter. You know, expert systems have this flat curve and so does machine learning has that flat curve. You try to get it better and better and you need orders of magnitude, more, more training, more data. They both have that unfortunate reverse curve of performance versus effort or resources. We're just the opposite. The better we got something modeled, it's slow at first and then it gets faster and faster. And you know why that is? Network effect? Well, it's like a, yes, but it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Imagine when you're putting mm. the other pieces. It's really slow at first, but at the more of it you see, the faster it goes. Got it. Right. Because our individual ideas are just like pieces of a jigsaw. Only certain ones can fit into certain ones. Right. Putting the last 10 pieces in a jigsaw goes much faster than putting the first 10 pieces in. Right. What do you use as a figure of merit for measuring how well it's doing to know how good it is and how good you want it to be? Well, we actually, it's, it's, it's rough, but it is quite useful. We use something called Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning. Did you know what Bloom's Taxonomy is? It's, it's, Tell us. Well, uh, it's something that educators do to assess the cognitive or the comprehension skills of human students. You know, starting out early on, they're happy if they can just kind of process language to the point where you can tell them, give them a simple statement, and they can answer a simple question about it. Okay, what is a cat? A cat is a mammal. Okay, what is a cat? It's a mammal. That's level one. They sometimes call that memory or rote learning, as it were, maybe not a deep level of understanding, but it goes up to six more levels. And the next level is being able to translate from language to ideas so that you understand what something means regardless of how it was said. That's level two. Level three is to apply what you've learned that way and its ramifications to what you already know about the world. That's level three. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're definitely on two and into level three. And the place that today's AIs like GPT-3 fall down is usually in somewhere, the example is called a Winograd scheme, yes. where it requires actual understanding of the terms to be able to answer the question. You can't do it with the stochastic parroting that they're doing. Right. So just pulling an example from Wikipedia, I got here their example, the city councilman refused to demonstrate as a permit because they feared violence. And then the question is, who is the they in there? And does it refer to the city councilman or the demonstrators? It requires understanding to know which one. Have you used the Winograd schemas for benchmarking what you're doing? Well, we have not. Not that Winograd schemas are particularly, well, they are difficult in a way, in that you need to have quite a bit of detailed knowledge and you have to have it in your model and you have to be able to also have the conversational context modeled in many, many cases. So it is kind of the harder things to do in terms of comprehending language. It really comes down to finding the reference to common nouns or pronouns. Which one are you talking about? And that's one of the hardest things to do in language comprehension and to do it based on knowledge you have to have it built up pretty well. So the answer is there. We know how to do it, but we won't be demonstrating winter grad schemas commonly until we get our model further built out down the road. I mean, we could concentrate on building up some of that in certain areas, but we're really not interested in having a winter grad schema test. We're interested in having the broad foundation that that kind of knowledge-based reasoning and that knowledge, applying knowledge to language. And probably along with that, we have a big task ahead of us to apply knowledge to linguistic analysis. Mm. Right now, we are using a, a machine learning based parser provided by Google, which used, guesses what the linguistic the grammar and syntax of a sentence ought to be. And it does okay, but it does things that are like all of these statistical tools, it does things that are just stupid. It comes out with a linguistic parse and say, what? That's not a noun. That's never a noun. <laughs> you know, but you know, <laughs> time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. Oh, so somebody asked us if we would tell a sapiens that it was very amusing. So we said, "Sure, I'll type it in." And it's more sophisticated now. But the first thing it said, "I have a problem with what you said. Time can't fly." And then in the next minute, it went into a, a processing loop. <laughs> <laughs> well, some humans could so, so, uh, <laughs> find themselves in the same situation. But I mean. The notion that time can't fly was a good one. I recently, it reads like back to common sense, but from what it knew about what the word fly meant, mm. it knew that that wasn't appropriate to time because we haven't gotten to the level that we start adding the metaphor. Right. 
Well, at least if you're at the level where you can now explain metaphorical language, then... It will be able to do that. I mean, once you get the literal understanding down, then you can recognize mm. the metaphor or you can recognize humor. That's one of the things that's going to be fun about sapiens when they get down the road is everybody's always believed that AIs won't get jokes. Well, actually, ours will because most joke humor is based on a violation of some epistemological rule or some violation of common sense. Mm -hmm. A snail won't walk into a bar. Snails don't walk into bars, you know? Oh, this must be a joke. <laughs> yes. You know, I recognize the pattern. This has got to be a joke. All right, go ahead. That's amazing stuff here. We're actually running out of time. So I want to ask you to tell our listeners how they can find out more about what you're doing. Oh, thank uh, you. Get in touch with you or follow your work and discover more about Sapiens. Thank you. I appreciate that, Peter. The best place is to learn specifically about our approach and our technology is on our corporate website, uh, usapiens.com. And I also have a blog site personally, which I talk about the future and uh, called forward to the future. Dot com, which I would, for instance, one of the things we've been on recently is we have something called the AI hypometer because there's so much hype going on that about AI these days that uh, somebody has to say the emperor has no clothes. But anyway, a lot of good material on that. And then we have a website we've recently put up specifically aimed at telling you about our first product, the Companion Sapiens, uh, which you can imagine to be something like, you know, what you would like theory to be <laughs> someday, but isn't when you have a digital personal companion, actually understands what you're telling it. Well, I will be first in line or one of the first in line for that. So I uh, appreciate you letting me know about that, telling all our listeners about that and really looking forward to seeing where you go with this. So Brian Cruz, thank you very much for coming on AI and You. Peter, it's been a pleasure and thank you so much. That's the end of the interview. I was particularly interested in how Bryant got into this by looking at people in an operations room, basically all acting like little cogs in a machine and thinking that this wasn't the best use of humans' unique abilities. And also that so much energy is going into cracking the artificial general intelligence problem. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, a team at DeepMind challenged the accepted wisdom that transformer language models need to get bigger as in number of parameters, to get better. And there are some huge ones right now. Google just came out with one with 540 billion parameters, which is three times the size of GPT-3. But the DeepMind researchers built a small model, relatively speaking, called Retro with 7 billion parameters, and showed that it performed as well as a larger model, one called Gopher, which had 280 billion parameters. It doesn't need as much training, and the key difference is that Retro has an optimization for improving its responses by looking through a database of two trillion text tokens for similar language, sort of like cribbing from real examples of how to speak better. It'll be interesting to see how this sort of research plays out and how it compares to what New Sapiens is doing. In next week's episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Richard Arfeld, a PhD in aerospace engineering and data science, and founder and CEO of Monolith AI for improving the efficiency of engineering decisions with AI. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control, and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.